Locked On Podcast Network presents Locked On Sports Today. The New England Patriots and New York Jets have the exact same record. I know that's not a good thing if you're the Jets. Also, the Browns exercised a lot of demons on Sunday, and the Cowboys and 49ers battled for relevancy. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet, and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. I'm Peter Bukowski, starting your day with the can't miss stories and biggest debates in sports. You're locked on sports today. Searching all major sports. Found. Let's start with the biggest story. A day with the worst team in football was just what the doctor ordered for the New York Jets. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm getting word. Uh, the New York Jets lost to the New England Patriots 25 to 22 after Drake May went down early on in this game. Jacoby Brissett, the quarterback of the New England Patriots for most of this football game. John Butchko from Locked On Jets joins me now and and John, we would never play Jacoby Brissett over you, but uh, this this has been a saga. It has been uh, uh, there. There are like uh, so many hackneyed, cliched words that we could go through for this Jets season. I, it is startling to me that we are in this place. I'm almost at a loss for words with this team right now. Yeah, um, this is like one of those iconic teams that you know you see in sports history where they have all these huge names and it just doesn't come together for whatever reason. And I mean, you think about like the 2012, 2013 Lakers when they got Dwight Howard and Steve Nash and Gasol and Kobe and you know the Dream Team Eagles in 2011 after all yeah. their big moves. Um, one analogy I've used on Locked On Jets was uh, Mets team from like 32 years ago, the 92 Mets who had the highest payroll in baseball. And there was a book about them. They finished fifth place in the six team division. There was a book about them. It was titled the worst team money can buy. And that's actually, I've referred to the jets as the football version of the worst team money could buy, but that was before they lost to the Patriots. I, I think that they're now worse than the worst team money could buy at this point. And that is a pretty brutal place for this team to be. Um, the Aaron Rodgers questions are, are going to get louder. The are we sure it was Robert Sala's fault questions are going to get are going to get louder. If we boil all of this down to why this team has underachieved this season, what is the simplest, clearest explanation you can muster here? They have a lot of big names, but the reason these guys are big names is past performance, not what they're capable of doing now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Rodgers is he looks 40. I, I don't think there's any way to put that. Um, he statistically actually had a pretty decent game, but if you watched it, he was very inconsistent. Um, he really can't move anymore. In fact, I mean, even guys on the Patriots defense were saying, you know, they, they were shocked by how much Rod Rogers was struggling to move. And you can just tell he's afraid of getting hit right now. Uh, and, you know, he's playing with like three injuries. He was on the injury report this week for a knee, an ankle and a hamstring. So I think that plays into it. Um, you know, Tyron Smith's been a disappointment for this team. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Mike Williams has done nothing. I mean, part of the reason they went out and got Devontae Adams was how little Mike Williams has produced. Um, I know Adams has only been here two weeks, but he really hasn't produced a whole lot. Um, he had his, his statistical line is okay, but that includes a meaningless catch he made as time was expiring. Um, Hassan Reddick finally appeared, did nothing. And, you know, um, the, thing with, the thing with Hassan Reddick, I was really looking for him that last drive because the Jets were trying to close out that game. They had a lead didn't really get near the quarterback on, on that drive and it was quiet all game. Um, it's a team full of big names, but it's a team full of big names who are not as good as they used to be. And I, I think you have to question, especially with the Reddick stuff, you know, it's, it's a, it's a collection of players. Is it really a team? I mean, I'll put it this way. We know what happened with Devonte Adams and it's probably, there's probably a more polite way to put this, but, if we're being honest, Devontae Adams quit on the Raiders and he essentially showed up for the Jets and the guy who just who literally just quit on his team showed up and was alarmed by the culture he saw in the lock in the locker room, which you know speaks volumes. Um, I think the other, you know, another thing is, look, I don't think Robert Sala was a great head coach. I think based on the merits, you could justify the decision to fire him, but it has not worked out at best. It's been a neutral at worst. It's probably hurt the team because the defense is, not played as well since he departed and mm -hmm. it's either because they lost Salah 
or because now Jeff Ulbrich, who was the defensive coordinator, is being pulled in all these different directions because he's the interim head coach. So, um, you know, there's no, no no simple answers, but I think those are the places I'd start. Okay, so then where does this team go from here, understanding that the trade deadline is also – uh, a little over a week from now, and and this is a team that was expected to compete for a title. Is this is this just a sunk cost season, or is there a desperation move you think is coming here for New York? Oh man, I, I hope there's no no more resources thrown at this team because nothing's worked. This team is not a player away. I we we talked about this when the John, you have been with. on this every single week when we have talked. You have said this this team is not who they think they are, and I just I I need to give you your flowers because you have been right on this every step of the way so far. Yeah, I wish I wasn't, um, but. Look, what they should do, though, I don't think they will do this because I think the owner is too prideful to do this. They should look to trade every guy who's 20, 30 or older. I, I would, who's got a name, just like yeah. you just were talking about. And I mean, like, I know, like, they're not the thing would be embarrassing because, like, if they try and trade to Son Reddick, there's no way they're going to get third round pick back. That'd be a sunk cost. There's no way they're getting a third round pick back for Devontae Adams. Mm -hmm. Look, imagine how bad you'd look if you trade him a couple weeks later, but it's the right move because the season's finished. I mean, they're two and six and it's, it, it goes beyond being two and six. This team has not played at the high level at all. The only time this team has played at a high level in any of their first eight games was the week three game against the Patriots. Um, they're two and six. I think they've only had two opponents who have played well against them, San Francisco and Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh was really the only one half and both those teams blew the jets out. And yeah, I mean, the Jets have two wins this year. One was against New England, who you know is one of the worst teams in the league, who beat them, and, and the other one's Tennessee, who's one and six and just got annihilated by the Lions. Um, so there's really nothing that says this team can play at a high level. Uh, it's you know it was a team that looked good on paper before the season, but it's just not, it's it's one of the worst teams in the NFL. I, I it's uh, I know it's crazy to say when you look at the names on this roster, but. At some point, you have to stop looking at the names and start looking at the results. It, by, by what objective measure, based on the way this team played this year, is it not one of the worst teams in the NFL? Stay up to date on the New York Jets all year long by subscribing to Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Jets on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Thanks for making Locked On Sports Today your first listen. Coming up, the Browns got a win with Jameis Winston at the helm against one of the best teams in football. Before we get to that, Tua returned but didn't get the win. If you're an NFL fan and you're looking for a big return, look no further than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Plus, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. And you can put that $5 on Monday Night Football. The Steelers are solid favorites tonight against the Giants. I actually already have this one in my dance card with Russell Wilson's debut sending good vibes to the Steel City. FanDuel thinks Pittsburgh can keep it going. They're favored by five and a half. So what are you waiting for? That's FanDuel.com to get started. returned but the Dolphins still lost in which the Dolphins for the second consecutive week blew a 10-point lead and managed to fall with another loss that frankly should have been a game that they controlled the the flow of from start to finish that's not how this game was realized uh, Dolphins falling to two and five on the season with a walk-off field goal by the Arizona Cardinals Miami losing 28 to 27 uh, and Boy, uh, I think this game is a perfect microcosm of what this season has been for the Dolphins thus far, really. Even the buildup, right, where Zach Sealer can't go. We find out on Friday Zach Sealer has a, an orbital fracture uh, for getting poked in the eye at practice, and it's being determined if he needs surgery. And, uh, and the Dolphins come out and... They play pretty tough and give up less than 150 yards of offense and seven points uh, in the, the first half of this football game. And then the Cardinals that score on every possession except for one in the second half of the football game and went over 250 yards of offense in the second half. And Colin Murray was unstoppable, and, and the absence of Zach Sealer was felt. Uh, I don't think not having Zach Sealer lost you the football game, but certainly there was just no – presence 
of disruption around Kyler. And, and, you know, as this game wore on, this was, this was painfully apparent. So uh, I think the focus from here is one thing that we're going to look at, and I think it's important to look at. Uh, but the situational issues and non-complementary football elements of this football game are the things that stand out in a big, 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 big way. The Falcons got a potential season-defining win over the Bucks. You know, it was a huge win. You know, I feel like this game kind of – a part of this game was kind of the part of the season. Uh, it's sort of a microcosm of the season because, for me, I remember at the end – of the third quarter when the Falcons went up 31 to 17, you know, I, I told the lockdown Falcons insiders hit the link in the description. If you want to become a lockdown Falcons insider, so you can get my commentary throughout the game, as opposed to just waiting to the end of the game. But I was like, yeah, the bucks are going to score again. They're going to get at least two more scores uh, this game. And the question is, will the Falcons get that last score uh, in order to sort of finish this game? The bucks scored twice. Uh, getting a safety and then a touchdown to sort of cut the lead to 31-26. The Falcons had a chance to extend their lead, uh, and Young Way Koo missed that field goal uh, in the closing minutes, and then the Bucks went down the field and had an opportunity to to hit the game-winning uh, touchdown at the end. And fortunately for the Falcons, the Bucks fell short, or you know maybe went a little too long because Baker Mayfield threw it out the back of the end zone, uh, and Raheem Jarrett wound up catching it, but out of bounds. Um, and so to me, like this is kind of I think a microcosm of what I think the Falcon season is going to be where you're going to look at where they are right now, five and three, four and oh, in the division, you're thinking, Oh, this thing is locked up. Just like probably a lot of you guys thought once the Falcons went up two scores uh, late in, you know, in the third quarter or early in the fourth quarter, whenever it was, you're like, Oh, th- this is, this is a wrap. I don't have to worry about this game. And it's like, mm, it's the Atlanta Falcons guys like pump the brakes a little bit. They're going to make it interesting whether they want to or not by the end of the season. And Jaden Daniels, didn't have his best day, but, but he came up with the best last second throw to snatch a victory from the jaws of defeat we've seen in DC in quite some time. We said it before, but the previous Washington Commanders absolutely would have dropped the game that just went down here week nine in Northwest Stadium in Landover, Maryland. 18-15, to 15, the Washington Commanders pull out an unlikely, nearly impossible win at the end of the game. It looked like number one pick Caleb Williams was going to be the hero of the day, leading the Chicago Bears back in the second half to take the lead with less than a minute left in the game, but with just ticks left on the game clock, Jaden Daniels. Hail Mary, 52 yards, finds the hands of wide receiver Noah Brown, and the Washington Commanders are 6-2, and two, still in first place of the NFC East Division. Never been in an environment like this one, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you come through for the Locked On Commanders podcast for more part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. The Cleveland Browns made the move to Jameis Winston after the Deshaun Watson season-ending injury, and wouldn't you know it, they looked not just like an NFL offense, like a really good NFL offense. Jameis 334 and three touchdowns in a 29 to 24 upset win. Jeff Lloyd from Lockdown Browns joins me now. And, and Jeff, uh, you were on the show a couple of weeks ago going, you know, look, they, they need to make a move, but they're probably not going to make a move. The injury forces the Browns to get to this place. Even so, what stood out to you about this? Because I'm not sure anyone, even the most optimistic Brown supporters, could have predicted this showing from Jameis Winston and company. I actually concluded the pregame show with the Browns may look much better this week, but it might not matter. Um, but you get into this. Look, Jameis, this is not his first rodeo, You know, certainly his third NFL team. The Browns, we've seen this numerous times when Deshaun Watson couldn't go. Others were able to carry the mail. And it's, look, it's difficult. And in life, the biggest mistakes are the ones you don't necessarily want to admit. Hey, honey, I'm sorry. I forgot to pick up the eggs. You know, man, yeah. we're short on our bills this month. That's a whole different conversation that you want to have. So for the organization, you kind of get it. But it was getting really, really tough to get force fed. Deshaun Watson gives us the best chance to win every week. Everybody, myself, anybody, you know, fans, anybody covering this team was well, let's prove it. Well, we saw it today. And the thing that I thought about Jameis was he was going to give them a puncher's chance. Jameis was not going to get ghosted by pressure. If Yes, the offensive line was better today, and we've probably seen it all season. And that is not so much a Deshaun thing. That's the fact that 
they're kind of getting a little bit of cohesion going. So certainly that helps. But Jameis was going to either throw you into this or throw you out of it. He wasn't going to sit <laughs> just with the ball in his hands. Exactly. But what you also noticed was 20 completions to wide receivers. Mm. When the Browns were good last year, Amari Cooper had a great day and everybody else kind of ate. Everybody ate today. David Njoku ate. Judy ate. Elijah Moore ate. Cedric Tillman, his second straight really good week. Yeah. A guy that should excel in this offense because he's a bigger guy, more size than the Browns are normally accustomed to. So, look, I don't know if this is the be-all, end-all, and all of a sudden this season is resurrected. The Browns did also have, you know, the the Jim Donovan thing going, which kind of made everybody feel, hey, this team is going to show up tomorrow. Jim Donovan was a huge part of this organization. They understood when he stepped down and said, this time I'm not coming back. We all kind of understood where this was going to go with a situation like this. What? for me also is a good thing because this team needed to show that they still got some heart and they still got some fight into them. Yeah. And they went out there today, played all facets of the game, played them well. But most importantly, for those of us who had our doubts that maybe a change would lead to success, that was confirmed. We don't know what's going to carry, you know, on the weeks coming on, but we felt there could be more from this offense. And we certainly got to see it today. I want to ask you about Cedric Tillman because um, there there have been a lot of reports around how the Browns are going to proceed from this season. Um, even at two and six, it is not optimistic in the AFC. That being said, teams have apparently, according to reports, called on Miles Garrett. The Browns have made it clear we're not doing that. But Zadarius Smith, Ogbo Okwankwo, Craig Newsome, like there are some guys that could be out there to be had if you're the Browns. Do you do you play out the string or do you like look we we got to take we got to at least take these calls and figure out what's going on does does anything that we saw on Sunday change the way you think they approach the rest of the season well, they're actually in a pretty good situation as far as this is concerned they're home next week against the Chargers they go in the bye week right after that so look that game may sway things one way or the other but they go into the the fifth um, it's going to be a pretty important day all around the world, not just on the football field mm, or the yep. NFL world, <laughs> but the Browns will be in bye week that week. So it'll be a big evaluation time. Say, Hey, if you're three and six, all of a sudden, maybe it does change some things, but look, Zadarius Smith, if a contender is interested, I don't know where he's basically breaking down the door in the Browns success or non-success, you know, Ogbo, Maybe he stays because they need the cheaper veteran to stay, and he would probably be cheaper as far as the Browns return, maybe than Zadarius Smith, maybe a little more brand name factor with Zadarius Smith. Mike Hall, their second round rookie, did play some base DN today. You're also evaluating a guy like Isaiah McGuire while you have these opportunities. We'll see where you're at next week. And this is the tough spot, spot because conceivably, if they play like they did today, they should be able to at least beat the Chargers, you would think. Um, but they just needed a good day. This team, this franchise desperately needed a good day. I think the bigger questions as far as the Cleveland Browns are concerned are once, whenever 2024 ends. Because yeah. now we're talking about serious dollars, serious names. But, I mean, Greg Newsom. I don't think that the Browns are going to make, you know, make or break things anyway. Uh, if the compensation's in their favor, these are analytic people. They're going to, sl you know, slam the gavel. You know, with Newsom, though, also he's playing a little bit poorly and his fifth year option's already picked up. So you're not just getting him for a year. You're also on the hook for the fifth year option. Zadarius is a guy who's certainly. Cornerback money, too. It's not a cheap fifth year option. No, it's not. <laughs> you know that all too well, Peter. Obviously, a lot of first round picks over in Green Bay as well, playing the position. Um, the Browns, the best thing for them is. Let's go win next week, and we'll have that conversation the second we walk out the door, and we'll have it all the way up until 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, November 5th, as long as you know we step out and you know, vote the way we got to vote. Well, uh, we'll have a, an answer on the Browns November 5th. I'm not sure we'll have an answer on anything else November 5th, but we will see, Jeff. I appreciate the time, pal, as always. Stay up to date all year on the Cleveland Browns by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and Locked On Browns on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Coming up, the Niners and Cowboys. It's a little throwback to the 90s. They were trying to cling to their playoff lives on Sunday night. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. 
Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. The Cowboys and 49ers are fading fast in the NFC playoff picture. They both, they each needed a win on Sunday, but only one could get it. Landon, the Cowboys lose again. Mm. Uh, for whatever reason, the bye week did not cure all of their problems and all of their mm. ailments. Uh, the Cowboys lose 30 to 24 in a really weird game because the yeah. Cowboys jumped out to a 10 to 3 lead and it felt like, okay, this thing is starting to settle down a little bit. And then I believe the 49ers scored 27 straight points or something like that. It's 24. But 24 yeah. straight points. Cowboys battled back, actually had a chance to win this game in regulation, right. and did not gain another yard. So I don't know whether to feel. Upst- uh, feel good that they battled back. I don't know whether to feel bad that it got so ugly to begin with. I I I don't know how to feel other than just general disappointment. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I think general disappointment is a good one, right? But I, I I listen. Part of me is like, and this is this is to shows you where the state of this team is. Honestly, is that. I, I was glad to just not see them blown out, you know, like, I mean, well, and I, I, tweeted I, that, like it was another non competitive fourth quarter and it actually became one late, right. in the compa- you know, late in the quarter. It did. And, and, and I was, I was, I actually really appreciated that they, they put in the effort and was and fought back and, and put themselves in a position. Um, but it, I mean, it doesn't make me feel good about this team because once again, like, look, I mean, the, the, the problem is that we go into this game we know that this defense is is compromised. In, in fact, it, it probably, it, you know, as of Sunday morning, is more compromised than we even imagined because uh, because Carson wasn't even playing despite practicing all week, right? And then we we find out that the starting running back isn't playing. That that's part of another segment later that we'll talk about. But it just you know it started the vibes around the team just at that point. It just started to really kind of snowball, and then the the slate of games that like, went through the, the the early in the afternoon games didn't fall the Cowboys' mm-hmm. way. Certainly, the for lining up their playoff chances. So all this is to say is that. You go into the game with just incredibly bad vibes. It's like you go off, they go into the bye, and, and and things just kind of continually got worse, and it all kind of crescendos before game time, and then somehow you manage to get into halftime with a a ten to three lead. It was a ten to three, I think, right? Or ten to six? Maybe? Uh, ten to six. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I I thought that that was about as good a, a first half outcome as you could have, right? Yeah. Uh, it was just a roller coaster of a game, and then obviously the third quarter happened, and the, 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 it felt like the game was completely out of hand. Uh, and, and then uh, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, it got within a six point game at a certain point with the Cowboys having an opportunity with uh, with the ball in their hands with just over two and two two minutes and some change uh to, to go down and, and win the game not not like tie it up but no, go no, score win. Down and win the game um and and obviously a, a disappointment in the offense ineptitude in the offense reared its uh, reared its ugly head again as the cowboys go comp- oh for four uh just not not just a three and out a four and out you know um just really really just uh just depressing sad yeah. stuff really. so we're, we're going to talk about the offense and the defense and all that stuff. We're going to do some big picture stuff now. Mm-hmm. I Even on the final drive of the game, when the Cowboys had a chance to win it, I, I, I felt numb. Almost to the point of like, hey, this is cool if they pull it off, but like this isn't a good team. Like, And I and it's a weird spot to be in. And I, You and I were talking pre-show. Like, This isn't a fun Cowboy team to watch. I don't think they're very good, as evident by their record in their last couple mm-hmm. games. And they are they are in a spot that you and I have really never been in before covering this team over the last seven or eight years where they have basically been highly competitive in every season. And then the seasons that they weren't 2020 was because of a big injury. Like, yes, they have Michael Parsons hurt, but they have their quarterback healthy. They have the entire offensive line healthy. CD Lamb's healthy. They're just not very good. And finally, Joe Burrow knows the answer to the problem of how many wins do the Bengals need to be a playoff team? He says 10 is the magic number. He set up the goal. We've got to get seven out of nine. That's all well and good, but maybe Burrow and the Bengals ought to focus on the number one, which is how many home wins they will have this season. 
when they eventually win a game at Paycor Stadium. They lost on Sunday 37 to 17 against the Philadelphia Eagles. They are now three and five on the year. If you're catching this episode after hearing your favorite Locked On show, make sure to subscribe to Locked On Sports today on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, if you're a new subscriber to Locked On Sports today, we're here for you with the biggest stories in sports every day. Coming up on the next Locked On Sports today, how long will the Russell Wilson honeymoon phase in Pittsburgh last? So at least until tomorrow, stay Locked On Sports today. Locked On Podcast Network presents Locked On Sports Today. Go to our video on demand. Click on sports at the top of your screen. There you'll find past episodes of Locked On Sports Today, plus other Locked On shows on demand.